at number 10 is It's House Vendors. Recognized as an ancient heritage profession and was at its most popular during time periods of ancient Egypt where women were restricted from going out when married. These vendors would roam neighborhoods with buckets and baskets of product for sale. Clothing, perfume, fabrics, snacks. Now what was unusual is that the vendor was more often women than men. Walking the streets alone, making these sales because many married women weren't allowed to go out walking the streets alone to make sales. You see the irony. Anyways, this profession found great popularity in single women and many also were called upon to act as nurses in homes of the wealthy when needed. The career is named Al Dalala, but the idea itself has long been extinct with the freedom for Egyptian women to roam commercial districts. For number 9 is jewelry making. Egyptians saw deep spiritual significance in their jewelry but also had a love of aesthetics and those two things combined to create some of the most unique and lavish jewelry found in history. Worn to ward off spirits, protect health, bring good luck and more, there were even certain colors and designs that were associated to certain gods and powers. And so Egyptian jewelers followed very strict rules regarding the mystical aspects of their jewelry creations. While a woman usually would not be a metal worker in Egyptian society, it was very common for her to be making jewelry. The tools were smaller and the process required less heat and thus less danger for her. Metal work techniques included precious metal sheets that were cut and shaped, notched together. Wire work was accomplished through strip twisting. Pieces could be held together with this wire stripping system or crimping techniques. These strips were also how link chains were accomplished as well as the securing of beads or the backs of earrings. And for jewelry designed exclusively for burial, the metal was often quite thin as the jewelry of the deceased was not subjected to the wares of everyday life. Precious stones, ivory, real flowers and shells were all common ornaments, as was name engravements but it was more common with royalty. Jewelry makers were women of high status due to these contributions and the revelry jewelry held in ancient Egypt. Number 8 is being a dancer. Ancient Egyptians loved their music and and dance. They were celebratory but also ritualistic at times. Farmers would dance to thank the gods for a good harvest. Dance groups would perform at banquets. People would go dance around the Nile in the lush season. The list goes on. Many men and women chose dance as a career and it was a highly respected one. Dancing was considered an acceptable and normal part of life and even important to it. Most festivals were incomplete without it. In fact, dancing was such a revered career that dancers could start as a peasant and become a high status person from it. Just like being a celebrity in the way that people would go to see them perform. Women at the time were even more revered for their grace, elegance and acrobatics. This career had seven types of dance. Gymnastic, movement, pair dancing, imitative dance which was like acting like animals, group dances like a historic cheerleading squad, dramatic dance was female exclusive and rested in illustration, war dances, grotesque dance and then religious chant dances at temples and lyrical dance which was usually a depiction of lovers. Wig makers are number 7. Egyptians loved wigs for a reason that surprises many. It helped keep their heads cool. I mean it also helped with hygiene and scalp pests and looking pretty but the heat thing is what really gets folks. Many Egyptians had shaved or cropped hair and the mesh like base of a wig versus a headscarf allowed the body heat to still escape. And as said, wigs were also a great shield from lice or other invasive bugs. The hair used in the construction of wigs and hair extensions was always human and was either an individual's own hair or had been traded or bought. Hair itself was a valuable commodity ranked alongside gold and incense in a count list from the town of Cahoon, which puts emphasis on the popularity of wigs. When hair was collected for a wig, it was thoroughly combed and then sorted into lengths individually. The Egyptians invented a variety of hairdressing tools and the wig makers would take the time to braid or coil the hair depending on the wig style, coating each with warm beeswax and resin fixatives so that it would harden when cool. The job itself isn't unusual, more so the booming industry it had. Wigs weren't worn to this extent anywhere else at the time and while yes they were functional against the sun, they were more so aesthetic than anything. Individual braid and extensions could also be attached to someone's scalp for aesthetics, the way that box braids, twists, faux locks and many other ethnic hairstyles are accomplished today. Wigs were made in a type of factory setting. Archaeologists have uncovered the remain of wig factories, wig boxes have been found in tombs and multiple mummies have been found with wigs or braided in extensions. Number 6 we meet our ladies of the night. Unlike most ancient and even modern civilizations, selling intercourse is illegal or was highly governed. In ancient Egypt this wasn't even close to the case, but rather the opposite in a peculiar way. Women who worked in the sexual industry
ministries were considered divine and respectable as their career was considered to please the gods. They earned high status and lived in luxury. Working freely and openly, these ladies adorned themselves with red lipstick and eye makeup that differentiated themselves from other women. They were also tattooed, diamond shaped dots along the thighs and on the fingers or images of the god Bess. When the French invaded, they brought STIs and they spread rapidly through the brothels and this prompted the French authorities to introduce a law forbidding French troops from entering the brothels or having these ladies in their rooms. Guess those ladies were hard to resist because anyone who offended the law received death penalty. Number 5 are the wet nurses. Wet nurses are found in all statuses and were for all statuses. One common denominator though is that the career kind of really sucked. Pun intended. So, first their social status was always determined by the status of who they were breastfeeding. Royal family, congrats on your special privileges, statues, private quarters, and your own tomb in the family pyramid. Also, her family would receive special perks as an extension of her. Now, royal families only wanted high status wet nurses, and while it's not clear how they were chosen, evidence suggests some kind of blood tie or faint familiar relation. Most wet nurses were from marginalized families in lower socioeconomic statuses and worked under conditions and pre definitive ways. Ages. Wet nurse requirements for any status were intense. She'd have to have given birth at least twice, have a large but healthy body due to the belief that large bodies were more nourishing. Despite that, her breasts should be medium. Too small, not enough food. Too big, the baby's spoiled. In addition to all of these prerequisites, the wet nurse should be sweet tempered, affectionate, and responsive to her charge. She should also abstain from intercourse because it could reduce her affection towards a child, and they also said no alcohol. A good call knowing what we know now. Wet nurses were women exploited for the products of their bodies. As slaves they were coerced for their milk, as lower social status women they were employed for their bodies to enhance their inadequate domestic status. Even her own household suffered physically and monetarily if a wet nurse defaulted or failed a contract. On the same page, surrogates are number 4. This is a widespread practice in Egypt. The first story of surrogacy found in Genesis 16 of the Bible was the story of infertile Sarah having Egyptian Hagar carry her child for her and her husband Abraham. Even Egyptian pharaohs had used concubines to produce heirs. They often married their sisters or aunts, and children born of these marriages were most of the time not in great or functional health and wouldn't survive. Any child born of a concubine for a pharaoh was accepted as his lawful offspring. Now, they were quite limited in their rights and they could only inherit the throne in case of the absence of another more entitled heir. Surrogates experienced similar contracts and status leveling as wet nurses. They were desired to be mothers already, have a bigger, healthier body. And naturally, beauty was a desired element as well. Women of low status who made a career of surrogacy often died in childbirth or from hemorrhages due to the repetitive birthing process. But for some, it was the only career they could have. Priestress is number three, and so while it was a male dominated field, many women were employed as a priestess or a high priestess at the temples around Egypt. Mostly from upper status, many were married to the priests, which they owed their position in society. Despite this, they played roles in the temple rituals, such as servicing goddesses Hathor, Neith, and Paquet, or working as dancers, musicians, singers, and acrobats in the temple. The most important priestess was known as the God's Wife Amun. This woman was usually the daughter of the pharaoh or sometimes his wife. She usually held a very high position in court and performed important rituals to honor the god Amun. The priestess was in charge of managing the gods' affairs, attending to ritual dances and performances, shaking their rattles and rattling their necklaces, which were long and heavily beaded objects. By the beginning of the New Kingdom in 1550, the title Chantress of Amun was used, and it was usually the wives of the priests who gained these elevated positions as well. The concept of a woman as a priest was unheard of in many kingdoms. A high priestess and the reverence and traditions of female gods being led by women were unusual to outsiders of Egypt who oftentimes restricted most priestly activities to just men. Number two is professional mourners. Okay, so here's a weird one. Professional or paid mourning is an occupation not only found in Egypt, but in China, the Mediterranean, and Eastern Europe. This practice is literally paying a stranger to attend a funeral to lament, deliver a eulogy, help comfort the family, entertain, or lay on the ground wailing. There's some range here, depends on what kind of funeral you want to have. These paid mourners made ostentatious displays, messy hair and smudged makeup, wailing, pounding on the ground or their chest, throwing themselves about as they smear dirt and sand all over their body while they screamed. It's a full spectacle. Now, another depiction of the paid mourners in Egypt is a little more chill. Two women impersonating the goddesses 
Isis and Nephthys. They were believed to play a special role in someone's death. Most inscriptions of a funeral where they are present as paid mourners, they are on each side of the corpse and their bodies are fully shaved. These women also had to be childless and have a tattoo of either Isis or Nephthys name on their shoulder. Most evidence of professional mourning is seen in pyramids and tomb inscriptions such as women holding their bodies dramatically in sorrow, braced over a casket with tears flowing. If you were a theater kid, this was definitely the type of job for you. And number one, it's the female physician. Egypt is a difficult one with historians. There's been a lot of largely ignored discoveries due to the opinions of those who found them. The evidence of women in ancient Egyptian medical fields is part of that because as it turns out, their physicians were actually primarily women. Evidence shows women in the medical profession going back into early dynastic period Egypt when Marit Ptah was the royal court's chief physician in 2700 BCE. She was the first female doctor known in world history, but there is another unnamed female physician who is listed to be the head of the Temple Neith Medical School in 3000 BCE, so maybe not. But either way, the first female doctor was in ancient Egypt. Women were highly respected throughout Egypt's history and many of their goddesses represented facets of health. Neith has been associated with the invention of birth and Hathor represents fertility. Four deities associated with healing are Heka, Sekhmet, Serket and Nephritim, which are all female. So, bizarre claims you may have heard that no women are involved in Egyptian medicine don't accord with the values of their civilization, which were incredibly equitable. By this reasoning, there were no women involved in anything of no anywhere in the world until the modern era, because history books make no mention of their contributions. But it's all up to say. I never tend to creation. Every religion and civilization from the dawn of humanity has come up with their own unique stories as to how the world was created. Some civilizations have credited aliens, others have credited a benevolent god, and many of these gods have their own unique ways of creating life. Though we've heard stories of gods creating people out of things like corn or mud or just thin air, I don't think these stories could even compare to the ancient Egyptian story of creation. These ancient people believed that their very first god, Atum, created himself. As such, he had no wife and literally no one else to potentially procreate with, and so to create his and thus create humanity, he, well, he busted Literally, he just gave himself a one to meat massage and boom. Out of that process, he created his kids Shu and Tefnut. A very fitting name, if you ask me. This legend, I guess you could say, created the term the god's hand. And this was used to refer to women back in ancient Egypt, since Atum's hand played the quote unquote female role in the creation of his offspring. This term was also carried over into other civilizations, like in the Greco Roman period. So if you ever hear someone say god's hand, now you know where that came from. At number nine, cheating death. These days, if you get caught cheating on your partner, the worst that could happen to you is you break up, or you get a divorce, or maybe even get exposed on social media. But back in the times of ancient Egypt, the punishment for adultery was much, much worse than having your relationship end. Instead, your life would be the thing that ends. Obviously, in any civilization, any kind of relationship can always happen outside of a marriage. The only varying difference is the punishment for it. For the ancient Egyptians, being caught having an adulterous relationship was punishable by death. Pretty harsh for having a sneaky link, but I guess they took their relationships much more seriously back then. One of the most famous cases of a serial adulterer, if you will, came from a man named Peneb, who was known to sleep with many married women and even had his own son join in on his escapades too. As you can imagine, things didn't really end well for them, so if you ever go back in time to ancient Egypt, just be careful of who you sleep with. Before we continue talking about some of the things that your teachers might not have taught you about ancient Egypt, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, Ancient WAP. Last year, there was a huge scandal concerning Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion's song WAP. It's a pretty racy song that had a lot of people up in arms about it, and it was all over the news. I mean, if you ever heard any songs from the early 2000s, then you would know that this kind of musical content really isn't a new thing, and little songs have been a part of society for a really long time, but it might surprise you to know that they even had some risque songs even back in the times of ancient Egypt. Historians have discovered some of these songs, one of which I can recite to you, and it uses some pretty imaginative wording to describe a woman's body. In an excerpt from said song, it says, quote, the one, the sister without peer, the hand 
handsomest of all. She looks like the rising morning star. At the start of a happy year, shining bright, fair of skin, lovely the look of her eyes, sweet the speech of her lips, she has not a word too much. Upright neck, shining breast, her hair true lapis lazuli, arms surpassing gold, fingers like lotus buds, heavy thighs, and narrow waist. Her legs parade her beauty. With graceful steps, she treads the ground, captures my heart with her movement. End quote. Now, it's no WAP, but for the ancient Egyptians, it was pretty spicy. At number seven, the ancient hub. Back in ancient times, people needed some spicy content to make themselves happy, you know? Before we had only fans and the hub, people in ancient Egypt had their own adult content to enjoy during their alone time. This piece of content was called the Turin Papyrus, and it was essentially just a scroll of a bunch of images on it with people getting busy in some frankly unimaginable positions. Like, I don't know when the Kama Sutra was created, but I feel like the Turin Papyrus certainly gave it a run for its money. The purpose of this papyrus is pretty much unknown, but there are some theories to explain its origin and why it was created, some thinking that it had political ties or something. Either way, historians use this document to further understand times in ancient Egypt. At number six, magic attraction. You know, we can't always have the best game when it comes to finding a partner. Sometimes it can be hard to get someone to go out with you. Many people just don't give up until they succeed, and sometimes that means that they will go to many lengths just to get a date with their crush. This was seen a lot in ancient Egypt, and at one point in later years of their civilization, they practiced magic to attract the one that they loved. Turns out that they practiced voodoo to get someone interested in them, and it was commonly done by men seeking out the woman of their dreams. In one case of this voodoo for love practice, a man had a magician make a voodoo doll of a woman that he wanted all to himself. The magician pierced the figurine with bronze nails and inscribed a tablet on it with a spell saying that this woman would not be able to drink, eat, or be with another man besides the one seeking her out. The spell also supposedly summoned a demon to follow her and pull her hair and intestines until she found her way to him. Sounds a little intense, but hey, I guess that's just what you do when you don't have Tinder. At number five, sneaky link. In ancient Egyptian literature, women were often portrayed as seductresses. One of the more famous stories telling the tale of a seductress is one called the tale of the two brothers. Essentially, the story goes that a man, his wife, and his younger brother all lived together. One day, the two men went out to do some farm work, and while they were out, the one man told his brother to go back to the house to get some grain sacks. When he reached the house, the wife noticed the brother and complimented him on his strength and tried to seduce him. The brother got angry and refused, but told the wife that he wouldn't say anything to her husband about their encounter. Still, she was worried that the brother would snitch, and so she made herself look like she had been beaten up, and when her husband returned, she pretended like the brother was the one who tried to seduce her. The husband got angry and threatened to kill his brother, but in an attempt to save his own skin, the brother told the husband the truth and even cut his bits off and threw his pee pee into the river just to prove his point, where it was promptly eaten by fish. Unfortunate. The husband then returned home to his wife, where he killed her and fed her to dogs. Not a happy ending for anyone, but it gives you a real sense of how adultery worked back in those days. At number four, no Viagra. Just like anyone else these days, back in ancient Egypt, sometimes people had performance issues. Impotence was apparently a really big issue for many Egyptian men. It was such a common issue that sometimes it infiltrated their art and there were some scrolls and statues about it. An ancient Egyptian proverb was created about such a topic that said, quote, He who is shy to have intercourse with his wife will not get any children. Now, obviously, there are things nowadays that can help with such an issue, but back then, people resulted to prayer and magic to help their little buddies out. Don't really know how well that worked out for them, but it's a struggle that a lot of people face, so at least they weren't alone. At number three, LGBTQ+. As with anywhere on Earth, there were same-sex relationships, and the same goes for ancient Egypt. However, documentation of such things were far and few. The only 100% clear-cut case of same-sex relationships that was documented in ancient Egypt comes from the story of Horus and Seth. The story goes that Horus and Seth were both vying for the throne, and one night, Horus pretended to be drunk, while Seth tried to take advantage of him while Horus slept. Not the greatest example, but it's what we've got that's actually confirmed. Another potential recorded gay relationship may have come from Egypt's King Pepu II, who was thought to have had a secret relationship with one of his generals at nighttime. 
One of the most well known potential gay relationships from those times though comes from a piece of Egyptian art that showed two men touching noses. Doesn't seem like anything too intimate, but back then touching noses was another way of kissing. The two men depicted though were thought to be brothers, so it's theorized that there was something a little spicy going on there, but we don't have to think about that one too hard. Item number two, dirty insults. What is your favorite insult? Don't be shy, you can tell me, this is a safe space. I guess I have a number of favorites, but one that I quite enjoy is saying that someone's mother is a horker, like in Skyrim. Back in the times of ancient Egypt, however, insults often included some kind of note. If they needed to hurl an insult at someone, they might say something like, quote, may you copulate with a donkey, or may a donkey copulate with your wife. People would also combine some kind of note with pointing out someone's flaws to create an insult. In a note found from one of the people who built one of the great pyramids, they insulted one of their co-builders by saying, quote, you are not a man because you cannot get your wives pregnant like your fellow men. Like, damn, that's pretty cold, dude. And finally, at number one, the magic pee pee. <laughs> Now, I had to save this next fact for our number one spot because it's probably one of the most bizarre things that I've ever learned about ancient Egypt. The Egyptian god Min was the male fertility god, and let's just say that he was quite unique. He was known for his bold feathered headdress and the fact that his loincloth snake was always being charmed, if you get what I'm saying. Men suffering from impotence would make offerings to him to help them with their fertility problems. Even to this day, figures of the god Min are used in magic rites. Men and women still visit the ancient temples to find figures of the god and literally rub his to overcome their problems. Sounds strange, but apparently so many people have done it that the stone that it's carved into has become worn down or darkened from how many hands have touched it. Now I can only imagine what this god's body count was. Kicking off the list at number 10, the first zoo. Long before the pyramids were even built, Egyptians were getting quite creative. They were the first to see a petting zoo. How brave is that, if anything? Yeah, let's just start touching animals and then see what happens. Let's do it. 6,000 years ago, Hierakonopolis was the capital of Upper Egypt during the pre-dynastic period. It was beautiful. It was sitting alongside the Nile River, which was even more beautiful back then, you can't even imagine. And in those days, perhaps the best way to flaunt your wealth was by getting an exotic pet. Yeah, the old Mike Tyson trick. There were excavations done back in the late 19th century by English archeologists James Quibble and Frederick Green, and they discovered that this town was once thriving with over 10,000 residents. It's a lot of people. It's a lot more people than we ever thought. That alone is amazing. That's a historical feat. But when further studies were performed, they also found the remains of an elephant surrounded in cosmetics, surrounded in ivory bracelets and amethyst beads, the whole glorious, you name it, a worshiped elephant. That's odd. Then they found the remains of cats and dogs, also worshipped. The dogs, slightly more worshipped. Common pets, some crocodiles. Again, brave owners there. There's also hippos, leopards, wild ox. It was a wild time. They were carefully buried, but the broken bones suggested a cruel history sometimes. But most of the times, they were pets. Not as bad as we thought there. I'm like, oh, ancient pets? No, they're good. A lot of ivory. Number nine, the first peace treaty. The first peace treaty in history ever was back in 1259 BC. Now at this point, ancient Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over what's now modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting for centuries. And finally, come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. Of course, there was tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. So what's left to do at this point? For the first time ever, a peace treaty was agreed upon. Ramses II and King Hadassuli III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if perhaps a third party decided to get involved. They saw their resources, they saw that they were lacking on both sides, so like, hey, we have no we have no shot, really. Let's just team up. A copy of the treaty can now be found in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official, if you don't believe me. Every 90s kid watching right now is like, oh, really? Amen. That's a fact. That's a true fact right there. Those holographic covers. What a trip. Number eight. King Tut's passing. Perhaps one of the greatest mysteries is of course the history of the young King Tut. Younger than we remember, honestly. The young boy became pharaoh at just age nine in 1332 BC. Yeah, what were you doing at age nine? I was mini golfing, maybe, I don't even know. During his time ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia at this point were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh passed away at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was ever seen again. That's when Howard Carter, of course, discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful, you know, historically, because when Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin. But in doing so, they got a little bit too excited. They didn't really know what they were doing back 
back then, so they damaged him. Yeah, they damaged an ancient king. How brutal is that? So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age, especially for a king. We have some ideas though, it's not entirely hopeless at this point. It was believed King Tut, after some 3D scans were done, had a broken leg. So he may have fallen off a chariot or something. So if King Tut passed at an early age, out of nowhere, hopefully this was the reason why, or else there's another mystery afoot. Number seven, board games. I love board games a lot, even Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, huh, talk about patience, my friends. They also loved board games. They created them. They got that board, kind of time. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen and Sinet, and 20 Squares, those are the classics. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC. Now the goal was to reach the center of the spiral, so we think we're trying to piece it together. The board was a coiled snake almost, pretty creative. Senate was the most popular game of all time. Queen and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now of course the rules are still unknown, still heavily debated, just like Monopoly even today. But we have some ideas how Egyptians played it. Three of 10 squares, the last five are decorated, so it's assumed, like everything else in ancient Egypt, that this was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these boards. I'm gonna be buried with a GameCube or something like that. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so that's how you know it's a good one. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. God, I'd be so anxious. I'd be so nerve wracking. I wouldn't even play checkers with a pharaoh. That'd be too scary. I'm bad at checkers and chess. I don't know how to play chess. I'm lying to you guys. I've never played chess. I don't know how to. Number six, Akhenaten Moon. This queen was ruling during the 18th dynasty of Egypt. The pharaoh Akhenaten, well, this was his daughter. She followed in her father's footsteps and was a great ruler, but she was also the wife and half-brother of one King Tut. A pretty conflicted spot to be in, historically. Her and King Tut had the same father, but their mothers were different. Now, after Tut's death, however, it's believed this queen may have married the pharaoh Ai shortly after, and perhaps she's buried near him right now in the Valley of the Kings. Back in 2010, DNA testing was being done in tomb KB21, and there were two 18th dynasty queens that were recovered from that tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Could it be, perhaps? There wasn't enough data that was found from the mummy, but they do know that the DNA is somewhat of an 18th dynasty royal bloodline, so we're definitely close. In another tomb, tomb KB63, numerous coffins were found, and one had an imprint of a woman on it, along with jewelry, women's clothing at the time, but the biggest clue, really, at this point, was pottery fragments. Of course, it's always in the pottery. We've all played Ogre enough time. Always check the pots. The name Potten was on one of these pottery fragments. That's another clue. The only person to ever use his name, historically, was the long-lost queen, of Akhenaten. So now we're getting real close. Dangerously close. But it feels weird to watch so many tombs be opened up at this point. Like, yeah, we're getting close to finding out things historically, but can we just leave these leading ladies alone? I feel like they dealt with enough men in their lifetime. Now we're just like, Boof. we're like, hey, is that her? Nope, we're good. It's like, eh, let them rest. They have fake doors. They don't want us coming in. Number five. Queen Nefertiti's disappearance. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, AKA Lady of Grace, AKA Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BC. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes. She was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Again, always so young and just forced this family forced fun. She worshiped the sun god Aten at the time, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital called Armana. She even created a new religion, she was onto some good stuff. She ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in Egyptian history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters. Many believe this has something to do with her disappearance. After reconstructing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen, just vanished. Yeah, historically, just like that, boom. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's side of the legacy. She was gone from everything, and many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather, she disguised herself and continued to rule. See, the next in line after Akhenaten's reign was Pharaoh Smenkeher. Was that really enough for Titi in disguise? I hope so. That's like some she's the man stuff right there. The reason we believe she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female Pharaoh, Hapshaput. She ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century, so so it's possible, we've seen it. And lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. Like I mentioned, she had six daughters and then she disappeared. This is, this is ancient history we're talking about. Always brutal, no matter what. Beautiful, but brutal. Number four, Cleopatra's. Sure, she may have been born in Egypt, but Cleopatra, despite what many believe, was not Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted for centuries. DNA-wise, she was barely Egyptian, but as she grew up, she was determined to learn all about Egyptian culture. And due to political structure, she started to style herself after the god Goddess Isis. She was the first Cleopatra that claimed to be Isis after the third Cleopatra. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's way more than we think. There's like seven. Number three, King Ramses VIII. The last son of Ramses III. He's the seventh pharaoh of the 20th dynasty. King Ramses VIII. Yeah, history is confusing with these numbers sometimes. I gotta tell you, I had to type that one out a few times. I was like eight, third, carry the eight, nine, Ramses what? The lost king had the throne for a very short amount of time and historians are trying to understand why that is. What exactly happened? What in the King Joffrey went wrong with King Ramses VIII here? He was the only pharaoh of the 20th dynasty whose tomb is still lost in the Valley of the Kings. So maybe it's not even there. And the thing is, with his ruling being so short, the theory out there is that the tomb of KB-19 that belonged to the son of Ramses IX, many believe this tomb was originally built for Ramses VIII. But once he became king, everybody saw his true colors. They must have changed their mind at that point or changed their lane or something. They were like, eh, uh, maybe not him, you know? There is a confirmed tomb that was never used for Ramses VIII, and that was tomb QB43. That was in the Valley of the Queens. It was made for him, but never used. Again, more mysteries. Oh, the poor souls who had to build all these tombs, and they're like, you don't need it? Okay. 57 years to make that tomb. You sure you don't need it? Okay. Number two. Baboon police. Ancient Egyptians worshipped lots of animals. We mentioned that earlier. They had zoos and elephants surrounded in ivory, all that good stuff. At one point or another, you've heard about how cats were highly respected back then, worshipped. But they also worshipped other animals as well. Sorry, cat people. The other animals are fun. Like baboons, believe it or not. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Egyptians had tattoos of baboons all over them. This was before Harambe, you know? Anyone monumental like that ever came around. The most famous piece of history that we have preserved is in the collection of the British Museum in London. There's a mummy on display and it looks a little slightly different than the rest. EA6736, fun name, but he was recovered from the Temple of Cones in Luxor, Egypt. This little man dates back to the New Kingdom period, so anywhere around 1550 BC to 10 BC. Yeah. He's quite old. Baboons would appear in art and religion all over ancient Egypt, and one of my favorite facts ever has to be that in ancient Egyptian times, pharaohs would train baboons to make arrests. Yeah, imagine stealing food and trying to run away, and then you look back and there's four baboons doing parkour behind you, telling you to stop resisting, hucking bananas at you. That's crazy. And number one, false doors. Imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb your entire life, all right? Imagine you spent years of your life dedicating everything to this research, and you finally find this door, this ancient door, you find an entrance carved into the wall. This is it. What lies beyond? You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it is a fake door, my friends. It is a false door. Yeah, you just got juked out from a guy 4,500 years ago. He's like, gotcha. Took long, we did it. False doors in ancient Egyptian tombs are very common. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead. How beautiful is that? And that is how spirits were able to travel from here to there, and back and forth. See, most false doors can be found on the west wall because Egyptians believed the west to be the land of the dead. The west, that's the west. Which way? Which way is north? Your west, my east. How does that sound? There we go. Mr. Unpopular, Xerxes the first is number 10. Xerxes is one of two pharaohs on the list who wasn't actually Egyptian. And it ultimately puts Homi in some hot water. He ruled during the 27th dynasty whilst Egypt was a part of the Persian Empire, having the throne from 486 to 465 BC. These Persian kings were acknowledged as a pharaoh despite not being Egyptian. So Xerxes the Great, as he was known, earns a place on our list by virtue of fame. He wasn't so great to the Egyptians though. He had a disregard for their traditions and religious beliefs and allocated funds away from their temple. He also banged his niece and gave her the robe that his wife had made for him, so his wife had her sister-in-law mutilated as revenge. It was this whole big scandal. But it caused Xerxes' brother to try and usurp him, something that Xerxes was already dealing with constantly as back at home in Babylonia, as well as in Egypt, people were trying to steal the throne away from him, causing him to ping pong back and forth between the two places. When he wasn't doing that, Xerxes was failing disastrously at trying to invade Greece. Eventually the embarrassment of his consistent failure to do so and the endless coup attempts on him was a bit too much and Xerxes abandoned the Egyptian throne. His failed attempts to invade Greece ensured that his portrayal by Greek historians and by extension the film 300 hasn't been very kind. Number 9 is a famous hussy, Ramses II. This man could not keep it in his pants. Sure, 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 sure. He was the greatest leader 
of the 19th dynasty and an amazing tactical mind and made Egypt prosperous, blah blah. He's the son of Seti the first and Ramesses went on to declare himself a god and the ruler of Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is an insane number for an era where the life expectancy was 30. But homeboy was not a modest pharaoh by any means. He was a lying two-faced politician who based his entire campaign on a laundry list of fabrications. The extensive architectural legacy of his reign are thought to have left the throne close to bankruptcy at the time of his death. Before getting to that ripe old age, as mentioned, Ramesses spent any free time he had Banging. Enough to sire between 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his sons. Ramses was one of the first rulers to take on the title of the Great before it was cool. All in all, he was pompous and spoiled. He left behind more statues of himself than any other person in the history of the world. He was obsessed with outshining all those who came before him, and he would tower over all those that would follow. Speaking of testament to ego, number eight is Khufu, the son of Seneferu, which I'm probably butchering, who is the first pharaoh to build pyramids. Khufu was on a one-upping mission since day one. He commissioned the pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world, which by the way we learned not too long ago is lopsided. The pyramid was originally covered in white limestone adorned with gold and since stripped away by greedy tourists over the last 4,000 plus years. He used his platform to also establish mining and trade from what's now modern day Lebanon. Unfortunately, while he brought greatness to Egypt in ways of infrastructure and economy, socially he inspired a lot of mixed reviews due to his use of force labor and a dismissive nature. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus was a particular critic, depicting Khufu as a vicious tyrant who used slaves to build his great pyramid. Now, many Egyptologists believe that these claims are merely defamatory, guided by the Greek viewpoint that such structures could only be built through greed and misery. If those rumors are true, then Khufu had high expectations and forced labor and no one liked him. If they're not, then he wasn't a bad guy at all. Number seven is Cambyses, the animal hater. This this is the other Persian pharaoh on our countdown, and he too enjoyed picking on the Egyptians he ruled, but in a very indirect way. See, Cambyses enjoyed watching animals suffer. It's said in his spare time he put on fights between lion cubs and puppies and made his wife watch as they tore each other apart. In fact, nearly every story coming out of Egypt at the time of his rule told about Cambyses involved him ruining the life of one animal or another. Early on, he went to see Apis, the bull that Egyptians treated as a god. Right in front of the priests dedicated to Apis, he pulled out a dagger and just start stabbing the bull until it died, laughing at them and saying, this is a god worthy of the Egyptians. What a prick. Number six is Menkuar, the pharaoh who refused death. Even though the title of pharaoh calls them undying and the pyramids are built to take them to the afterlife, you can't blame a person for still being fearful of what happens after they close their eyes for the last time. 25th century BC pharaoh Menkuar is the poster boy for that fear. An oracle once came to him and reportedly told him he only had six years left to live. Menkuar was terrified and decided to do everything he could to avoid it, even fool the gods. His biggest plan revolved around the idea that as long as night never came, a new day could never start. If a new day doesn't begin, time couldn't pass, so he couldn't die, right? Right. Anyways, on this basis, for the rest of his life, he lit up all the lamps he could and convinced himself it was always daytime. He would not sleep and force countless serfs to suffer with him this way. Every night, he stayed up drinking and celebrating the success until the day he died, because the gods will always have the last laugh. Sorostis, the genital king, is number five. Why genital king? Well, aside from being one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, he commemorated his success in a unique way by setting up a big pillar with a picture of someone's genitals on it. Male or female, he wasn't picky. He sent warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretched his kingdom further than anyone else ever had, leaving these pillars on sites of every battleground. Aside from genitals, the pillars were of course ingrained with how he had subdued his enemies and how certain he was that the gods were in favor of his invade everyone policy. Quite cocky of him. The genitals depicted were based off of how valiantly their opponents had fought their invasion. Male depiction indicated that they were strong and brave soldiers. But the female depiction, well, it meant the word that we are all thinking. These pillars were left all across the continent and they stood the test of time. 1500 years later, after being erected, they still stand in series 
bacteria engraved with the genitals of failure. Look up the word spoil and you'll see number four is Pepe II. He was the longest ruling Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. The first half of this rule he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half, nowhere close. In fact, it's the mark of the sharp decline of the old kingdom of Egypt as economic disarray was due to him virtually having no oversight. Pepe was made pharaoh in his early teen years, so naturally he got the spoiled brat treatment from mommy. A great example is shortly after being crowned, an explorer sent to trade and collect ivory, ebony and other precious items had written him a letter reporting that he had met a dancing pygmy. Why? This is the greatest thing Pepe had ever heard! He had to see it for himself. So he demanded its transport back immediately and to abandon all precious materials they'd gathered in return for a high reward. Well, he got his dancing pygmy and he got pretty much everything he's ever asked for. He learned to accept that he was more important than other people. By the time he'd grown up, he was so corrupt that he made his serfs strip naked, cover themselves in honey, and follow him around just to keep the flies away. Number three is the klepto gaslighting Amasis. He's remembered as a total prick. Amasis actually made his way onto the throne after the current pharaoh had sent him to calm down a rebellion, but when he got there he realized the rebels had a pretty good chance of winning, so he decided to lead them instead. Amasis decided the best way to tell the king about his change of sides and a declaration of war was by lifting his leg, farting, and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He was a rampant alcoholic as well as a kleptomaniac. Apparently he would steal his friends' stuff put it in his own temples and then try to convince them that they had never owned it in the first place. However, amongst all his bratty behavior, Amasis brought some major reform to oracles. One example actually comes from when he was a poor thief on the street. When he had been caught stealing, he had been sent to stand in front of oracles who were supposedly be able to divine tell whether he was innocent or guilty. Well, once he was king, he remembered which oracles had pronounced him innocent of the crimes he had committed and then punished for fraud. Because if they'd actually been able to speak to the gods, they would have known he was always guilty. Number two is cut Cutting down on crime, Actus Sains. Amasis wasn't tolerated for long and he was overthrown the way he'd done to his predecessor. This time the rebellion was led by the Ethiopian Actus Sains, who believed in a gentler approach to kinghood. Actus Sains fought for the crown literally because of a magic spell he'd heard about and also to deal with Egypt's criminals in a flashy new way, controlled exile. Every person who committed a crime he ruled would have their nose cut off and then they'd be sent off to the town he called Rhinoclora, literally the town of cut off noses. It was exclusively populated by these now noseless criminals struggling to survive in the harsh landscape, drinking dirty water and eating trash or the odd stray quail that came through. Something like this may have seemed harsh, but it was actually considered benevolence at the time. Roman chronologers of Rinacola, or Rincolora, whichever it's pronounced, wrote an example of how Actus Sains was actually considering a kindly manner towards his subjects. So keep that in mind when you're doing a comparison of now versus then. And in at number one is Akhenaten. This this pharaoh was so hated that the Egyptians themselves wiped his name out of history. Born Amenhotep, he changed his name to a Ahak, I'm gonna call him Ak, in accordance with this radical monotheistic drive. His new name meant that he is of service to the Aten, in honor of what he believed to be the one true god, Aten, the sun god. Ak did everything in the name of the sun god. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Amarnia, and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean Horizon of Aten, and then he ordered a new capital city be built there. He chose the site because it was uninhabited. It was not the property of anyone else except Aten. He moved an estimated 20,000 people into this developing city and forced them to build it. These people had to push through everything. Based on the bones found in the town's cemetery, more than two thirds of his workers broke a bone while they are working and a good one third of them broke their spines. Almost everyone was malnourished. When he enforced monotheism, Ak failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the national, socionomic, and cultural hubs. It was the gods' priests that oversaw the industries of agriculture and craftsmanship through their patronage and they who served as pillars of their communities. So by stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest recession and an entire empire nearly collapsed because of him. So it's no wonder after his death, Egypt immediately went back to polytheism and they also abandoned the new city he'd made them build. They destroyed his statues, his effigies, his monuments, and they removed him from their list of kings and history books. In fact, they did this so efficiently that we didn't really even know about him until his remains were found all alone in the city he had forced his subjects to create. Number 10, the beginning of the world. I Yeah, what, a, what an inventive way to imagine the beginning of things. I mean, the Big Bang is still pretty crazy too, but hey, here we go. Freaking love how much 
magic is in these stories, like I'm in, because that's all there was at the beginning of the universe according to the ancient Egyptians. Just swirling darkness, chaos, and magic. Heka, the god of magic, was the only thing that existed, waiting for the opportune moment to begin. Then a hill showed up called Ben Ben, and out of which the god Atum erupted from. He was lonely, so he mated with his own shadow to give birth to two children, Shu and Tefnut. Shu gave life, Tefnut gave order. They left their father to build the world, but they were gone so long he took out his eye and sent it to search for them. In the meantime, he just kind of sat there contemplating eternity all alone. It was really sad. This guy sounds like Zeus mixed with Eeyore. Anyways, his kids came back and he was so happy he wept tears of joy and out of which were born men and women. They also brought his eye back, so that was nice. Number nine, Hathor. The goddess Hathor was originally created by her dad, Ra, as a destroyer of men. She was supposed to punish all those who were disobedient to him. But then Ra was like, meh. I don't really like that idea, he just kind of changed his mind and decided to make her the exact opposite, instead the goddess of love. But she kind of loved killing men and like even he couldn't stop her. So one night he gave her what was supposed to be a mug of ale, but actually made it like a special kind of blood and she got so drunk off of it that she got too tired out to kill anymore and therefore became the goddess of love. <laughs> Drunk in love, am I right? Her cult was centered in Dendera, where she was also seen as the goddess of fertility and childbirth. When the Greeks occupied Egypt, they compared her with the goddess Aphrodite. But unlike the voluptuous woman Aphrodite was depicted as, Hathor came in three forms, and I bet you can't guess which. She was depicted as either a woman with a cow's ears, wearing the headdress of a cow, or just a cow. Moo. <laughs> Number eight, light as a feather. So unlike a lot of religions we've heard of, there wasn't really a concept of hell in Egyptian mythology. It was either you were worthy of heading into the afterlife or you weren't. Mat was the goddess of harmony and supported the belief that if harmony was disrupted, it must be restored. Every ancient Egyptian myth in some form follows this format. But the most important role she played was in the afterlife. When the soul left the body, it would appear in the hall of truth in order to stand judgment before Osiris. The heart would be weighed on a golden scale against Mat white feather. If the heart was heavier, it would be devoured by a monster and the soul would disappear. If it was lighter, then you could go live in eternal bliss. So instead of several layers of burning torment, souls in Egypt instead faced eternal darkness and unconsciousness. The idea of non-existence was more terrifying than being cut up by demons. Huh. Number seven, Osiris and Isis. Okay, so we aren't strangers to deities being a fan of incest. It was kind of like how they multiplied and ancient Greeks were okay with it kind of, but they kind of weren't. Anyways, the Egyptian gods were no exception. Isis and Osiris were two of the four children of the goddess of Nut. Isis and Osiris were married and actually, really in love, they, they, they dug each other. When Osiris rose to the throne as the eldest sibling, his brother Set was, pretty jealous. So he took the life of his own brother, cut him into little pieces, and scattered them all over Egypt. He really wanted to make sure the guy was dead. But then Isis wasn't someone you wanted to mess with. She had great magical powers capable of restoring life. She collected all of the pieces of her brother slash husband and breathed life back into him. Osiris returned to life and they made all the love and then soon conceived a child named Horus. However, Osiris couldn't return to the land of the living, so he had to stay and rule over the underworld. So his son Horus was left to get revenge and we'll get to that later. Number six, Anubis. Now I think in West Western films that depict ancient Egypt, like The Mummy Returns, the god Anubis is often associated with the underworld. You know, that creepy half man, half jackal creature who appears to walk out of your nightmares? Like, he's so creepy. Well, he did used to run the underworld until Osiris took over, but he was actually the god of mummification and the afterlife. So, not wrong, but not the whole story. Anubis was the son of Nephthys and Set. Well, Kind of. Nephthys actually never conceived the child with Set. She kind of had a, she kind of had the hots for Osiris. So she disguised herself as Isis and made love to him that way. And then 
Anubis came to life. That may have been one of the reasons Seth attacked Osiris in the first place as his suspicions rose. But it was actually Anubis who helped Isis piece together Osiris, creating the first mummy. Fun fact, during the Greek rule of Egypt, Anubis and Hermes were seen kind of as the same. The people who ferried the dead to the underworld. Oh sorry, and a point. Anubis was actually the one who weighed people's hearts, so he used the feather. The thing, you know what to do. He was responsible for doing that. Number five, Horus and Set. Speaking of Horus, earlier, remember how I said Horus had to take over defending his father? Well, here is where this story begins. When Horus grew up to be a man, he pulled a Hamlet. He was like, You killed my father, prepare to die. Thus, a series of battles ensued, and one of the gods didn't play fair. Set kept cheating at everything and continued to come out as victor. Not surprising since he didn't earn his way on the throne, he killed for it, kind of like a certain Claudius. Eventually Isis stepped up to help her son slash nephew overcome her brother. She set a trap for Set, but after some pitiless begging for his own life, she let him go. Horus was pissed, so angry some of the other gods got upset that he was so angry. They agreed to compete in a final boat race and Horus was like crushing it. He was doing really well, he was about to win. But then of course, Set cheated by turning into a hippopotamus and attacked the boat. Therefore claiming victory once again. Osiris finally showed up and declared that no man should take the throne through murder. So Horus took the throne. Why Osiris didn't just settle the whole deal from the beginning is confusing in itself, but hey, kinda reminded me of the eagles that showed at the end of Lord of the Rings that could've saved like three movies, you know? Kinda like that. Anyways, let's move on. Number four, Ra and his boat. Ra is one of the most revered gods in Egyptian mythology, especially since he was the god of the sun. He was depicted as a man with the head of a falcon. That kind of makes sense. He was once the greatest of all gods, but had to take a step back after he got too old and tired, and especially considering his task, I can see why. His job was to drive away darkness and sail across the skies, delivering light wherever he went. But at night, he would dive into the underworld and have to cross 12 gates. 12 hours, an hour per gate. After paying his respect to Osiris every night, a giant snake named Apophis tried to attack and swallow the boat. Every night! Poor guy, no wonder he got worn out. Every day it got harder to defend, and even one night, Apophis succeeded, but could only hold the sunlight for so long. She threw it up, which explained solar eclipses. After Set was cast out after the whole nephew battle, he ended up serving Ra in his boat and kept the snake at bay. But there's something confusing coming later that I think you'll agree is very confusing. So here we go. Coming up next, we have Bass, number three. Have you ever had a cat look you up and down and kind of like expect something? Like worship, you know? Are you a cat person, dog person? Let me know in the comments. Well, that's because cats were a big deal in Egyptian mythology. They even had their own goddess. Bastet was a cat goddess depicted as a woman with a cat's head. Cats had a meaningful role in ancient Egypt as they protected their food from rats and snakes. They were even seen as family members, and to harm one was punishable by death. Legend says that sometimes cats would enter burning buildings to save their families. If they died, the goddess would bring them back to life, hence the idea of cats having nine lives. There it is. Now here's where things get confusing. You know that story I told about Ra? Well apparently Bastet was in the boat with him as well. During the day she would ride with him, and at night she would turn into a cat and then defend the boat from Apophis the snake. But I thought that was set. So many conflicting things. I saw like a couple different stories who said, each thing was different, so who knows. Number two, Jeb and Nut. Yet another sibling partnership, we have Jeb and Nut. They fell deeply in love and could never be separated. They were that couple who would like constantly be like, oh my god, stop, right next to each other at dinner, you know what I mean? Jeb was the god of the earth and Nut was the god of the sky. A previously mentioned god, Atum, found their union inappropriate, so he pushed Nut into the sky far away from Jeb. He just didn't like being a third wheel. Jeb and Nut were close enough to see each other, but could never hold each other again. And she gave birth to Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Some say Horus too, but I don't think that's true. Number one, the treasure thief. Okay, I don't know how I feel about the story, okay? This doesn't really feel like harmony is in balance, but anyways. The treasure thief ends in a way I really didn't expect and I'm not sure you will either. Long ago, a great pharaoh with a wealth of riches decided to build a pyramid in which to keep them safe. One of the builders was wise to his plan and decided to find a way to claim them for himself. He built a stone vault with a hidden entrance covered by a slab so he could get to the riches. But unfortunately, he fell ill before he could return, so he told his sons of his plan. The sons headed to the pyramid in the dead of night, following 
their father's order. But unbeknownst to them, the pharaoh had laid booby traps and one brother was caught in one. Not wanting to be found or interrogated, revealing his other brother, he told his brother to chop his head off. Ugh, that he did. Loyalty? I don't know. The pharaoh upon finding the body hung it up in the town square in the hopes of like weeding out whoever it belonged to. But the other brother being so clever got the guards drunk and stole back his brother's body in the dead of night. The pharaoh was like, I'm not even mad, I'm just impressed. He gave the thief a pardon, summoned him to the square and gave his daughter to marry him. Yeah, dude, you tried to steal my jewels? Don't worry about it. Have my daughter because you're so talented at your job. Great work. Such as number 10, Basilica Cannon. So I really have been out here thinking all the types of cannons were just like big and small. I didn't really know they had actual names, but the Ottoman Empire's military technology was obscenely advanced, featuring firearms, gunpowder, and now cannons, thanks to their inventor, Orban, and the Emperor Constantine of the Byzantine Empire. See, Orban offered to sell his ingenious invention to this emperor, but Constantine couldn't afford the price. His attempts to bargain just dissuaded Orban from selling it to him even more. So Orban sold the cannon to the Ottoman Sultan, Mehmed the Conqueror, who was practically salivating at the mouth when he learned that this device could smash through walls with a giant projectile. After purchasing these cannons and their three month build time, he used them to defeat Constantinople in 1453, taking only 53 days to take over the city and the Sultan status. The cannonball, which could be shot at a distance of one mile, weighed 1,200 pounds. Due to its size, it was dragged by 60 oxen and four 400 men. Additionally, due to the material the cannon was constructed of, the intense heat created by the charge after each shot made the barrel have to be soaked in warm oil to prevent cold air from penetrating and enlarging the fissures, and it prevented it from being fired more than three times a day. Ultimately, it only lasted six weeks before it became non-functional, and the loading and transport of the cannon killed some of its operators. For a first time invention, I'd say that's at least still a pretty good track record. Number nine is a water pump, a six cylinder monoblock water Water pump to be exact. Now this is an insane and impressive invention. Created in 1550, it was innovative and made to run off of the water it pumped. So piston rods, lead weights, and then of course the delivery pipes all worked as part of a system of an oscillating water recycling and pumping device. The use of water wheel technology was widely spread in the Middle East before and after Islam. It's from this long lasting heritage that Muslim engineers adopted and improved this technology and applied it everywhere. In the city of Murcia, for example, during the Islamic rule of Spain, a water wheel was established, still known today under the name La Aurora. Although the original wheel has been replaced by a new one in steel, the original system that was built for it is otherwise unchanged. Muslim engineers used two solutions to achieve maximum output from a water mill. The first solution was to mount them to piers of the bridges to take advantage of the increased flow. The second solution was the ship mill, a type of water mill powered by water wheels mounted on the sides of ships moored in the midstream. It seems according to historians of technology that the earliest descriptions of this kind of machine in the west goes back to Cardin in 1550 and Ramelli in 1588, meaning that Taki was amongst the first to describe this water machine as he finished his manuscript in 1551-52 and that made him the first to produce the actual machine when he built it. Furthermore, it proved a remarkable invention as it helped with the water supply to the city's empire. Number 8 is the invention of mechanical clocks. So as you may know from our past Ottoman video, the Ottomans were incredibly advanced in astrological and celestial body understanding. That's how they achieved observatories and also astronomical clocks that indicated the positions of the bodies like sun, moon, and other planets. Taqiq al dins yes, the guy who did the water pump from the last segment, created a clock that could set off an alarm at a specific time. And while the alarm clock wasn't necessarily new, users could actually set Taqiq's clocks to go off at a specific time because of the peg he placed close to the dial wheel. When the dial was set to a specific time, the peg would set off the ringer when the clock clock arm touched the time. This was also the first clock capable of indicating hours, minutes, and seconds, aka he essentially invented time of day. This was obviously a significant breakthrough. All clocks existing before were inaccurate or still sundial based and couldn't be relied on for correct astronomical data. But Taki's invention meant that the world can now record accurate astronomical information. Logos are number seven. That's right, they've had a long journey to what they are now with glowing neon signs, the branding on our jeans, the image on your 
favorite soda can. All of it is traced back to the Ottomans and their invention of Tugra, an imperial trademark where writing takes picture form to denote a branding. How this started, according to legend, was an illiterate sultan who had followed the sacred practice of the sultan silence, but he could also not sign. So in order to tell his name, he once dipped three fingers in ink and then impressed them on a page. As a result, three lines are virtually unchanged and remained in all Sultan Tugras to come. All of their Tugras included the three lines, as well as two ovular loops on the side and the Sultan's name, his father's name, and the phrase, eternally victorious. While all Tugras had those features, they were all changed and unique to each Sultan. All Sultans as well as Princes would have their own Tugra, which court artists created anew with each ruler's succession. Perhaps the best historical examples are not so much the very similar Sultan logos, but the kind of graphic symbol Tugras used by the Ottoman officials on documents, coins, and other objects, as well as to mark buildings. Pastrami is gonna be number six because why not? Meat preservation outside of North America's indigenous clans goes back to the Romans and the Huns, but the Ottomans' take on it has become a widespread comfort food. Here's how the Ottomans advanced meat preservation methods by slow drying quality meat, oftentimes beef, goat, duck, or mutton, with days of smoldering or pressure, then further preserving it with herbs, spices, and of course, salt. There are even records of making pastrami by placing the meat in saddlebags where it was pressed against the rider's legs as they rode. So the result was a jerky-like meat, deep in color, strong in flavor. Because of the spices used and the meat's portability, the recipe migrated along the spice route of Eastern Europe before landing in the lap of Romania, where an adapted version of the recipe traveled with Romanian Jews to Lower East Side New York when fleeing persecution. Jewish Romanians began to make this preserved deli meat with beef as it was the most available. And due to the advent of refrigerators, they were also able to use a weaker salt brine and develop a softer form of cured meat, which was finally named pastrami. The current version in Turkey is made by rubbing beef in salt to cure it, drying it in open air for several days, and covering it with a thick spice rub, original to its tougher jerky origins. Forward date bank checks are number five, because its continuation has caused modern day Turkey to have a relative immunity to the global banking crisis. This practice actually came to be due to the Quran chapter 2 verse 282. The verse is quite long, otherwise I would quote it directly, but instead I will summarize that all debts must be kept in writing, on paper, under the written guarantee of two witnesses and with an expiry date, rendering every citizen to a bank and creating paper money when these debt papers were transferred. To ensure the fairness of any documentation, it's one of the only times where two women could actually substitute for one man as a witness. This is to guard against the possibility that one witness may marry the other, but this practice is actually actually banned in the West. While there's a lot of debate as to why, the main opinion is that it was simply the Westerners being mad or confused about how something worked in a region that wasn't theirs and banning it in their own, like how the Vikings being clean was slanderous to Brits. No matter what, the Turkey banking infrastructure saw pure benefit from this forward dating. Number four is medical tools. The Ottomans contributed hugely to modern medicine and the understanding of conditions, something we'll talk about a little later in the countdown as well. Ottoman surgeons, yes, they were doing surgeries way back then, they were first using bamboo shoots, shells, and even their cleaned fingers as their surgical equipment. They learned how to stimulate bladders externally to help surgical patients relieve themselves as well, like a human catheter. For these reasons, the Ottomans, with their stash of precious metals, went to work inventing forceps, scalpels, pincers, lancets, and the catheter itself. All of the modern versions of these listed surgical items are direct recreations of the Ottoman empires, advanced to be suitable in our modern times. Also usually thrown away after one use. <laughs> Additionally, I'd be remiss not to mention how they inspired modern medicine by establishing the first hospital and health centers. But wait, there's more. The healthcare was then divided based off of patient sex and treated them completely separately, even training female physicians to try and aid in the comfort of female patients in a male dominated medical field. They also adopted the holistic approach to treatment. They believe that when a person is sick, it affects the total being, including the physical and spiritual aspects. Number three is data protection laws. So similar to the forward date checks, this little thing has made a huge difference in the long run. The Ottoman Empire was extremely complex in terms of its multiple legal systems and hundreds of ethnicities and religions. So 
they began to document everyone and everything and base records on them, preserved in a Shari Deftered record book. Obviously, this data had to be correctly entered and double checked with whom it was about to ensure its accuracy. Obviously, this employed many people to do, and there was even developed control techniques and cipher shorthands to make the process quick and efficient and detailed. On top of that, if a page was to be ripped, removed, stained, torn, anything that created an inconsistency or damaged records, it was punishable by death. Ottomans developed a multi-religious, multi-ethnic governmental system where each community had its own legal, educational, and social services. Nothing like that it was really the same in our modern world. Meanwhile, tucked away under cities, in museums, and in government buildings are millions of books waiting to be decoded, read, translated, and analyzed at the Ottoman archives. Number two, we revisit what I promise, psychiatric care. Revolutionary is a great word for the Ottoman understanding of mental illness and disorders. Nowhere else was this level of understanding really found at the time, which was over 20 plus diagnosable mental illnesses that they named, wrote descriptions for, and learned how to treat. Now obviously they're different from our modern terms, but they're actually very accurate and symptoms were well recorded. Some are incredibly descriptive, capturing conditions we see today such as BPD, depression, insomnia, but also things like sleep apnea, apple and dyslexia and so many other more conditions. Even nicotine, alcohol, and opium addiction is documented. These classifications are found in the Ottoman medical manuscripts between the 15th and the 18th centuries. A majority of neurological illnesses are mentioned under the title of diseases of the head, and this is because illnesses caused by a central peripheral nervous system were, well, physically in your head, so they felt it counted with mental illness. So knowing what they did, the Ottomans catered to it. They built separate health facilities for people with traumas and mental illnesses where they were cared for and looked after until their release or until they passed. These properties had gardens, recreation activities, books, songs, and lots of access to fresh water and beautiful scenery. All of these items were believed to return a person to themselves so that they may feel whole and healed again. Music also played a factor in healing. In fact, music therapy is number one in our countdown. The Ottomans believed that the cosmos were created by the word k, as ordered by the universe's creator. This means that the beginning of the cosmos was started by a sound. So because of the belief that God was comprehended through a spoken word or sound that were also perceived as a letter, the essence of existence is believed to be a sound. Letters were believed to be the representation of human essence as a result. This correlation played an important part in the belief that music therapy might reestablish the upset harmony of a patient, creating a sane balance between body, mind, and emotions. Patients suffering from certain illness or the emotions of persons with certain temperament were expected to be influenced by specific modes of music. Certain makams, musical notes, were prescribed for therapeutic purposes. Modes put into patterns, songs, were believed to express special meanings. Though there were about 80 Turkish modes, usually only 12 were prescribed in therapy in accordance to the limitation of the related theories of cosmic elements and numerology, as it is in the Islamic and ancient sources. From old texts we can deduce the kind of music which was supposed to cure a certain kind of disease or create certain feelings and favor certain behaviors, though musical modes of those days are not the same as the ones we know today. Number 10 is tatted up tuts. Egyptians join indigenous, Nordic, African, and many other cultures of having a history of tattooing. Now Egyptian tattooing was bizarre just because it was exclusive to only women. By tattooing in public regions of the body, the tattoos were intended to permanently mark the woman's association with religious worship, or on the flip side, they could also be used to symbolize the lower class and the mark of a dancing girl or a prostitute. That's what also makes it so bizarre. We can't really figure out why it was only women, what they meant, or what they symbolized beyond the vague generalization I just gave you. Tattooed mummies dating back to the 11th century dynasty have been found by archaeologists, some with religious symbolism, other with dots and swirls located on the lower chest, the abdominal, and the thighs. Some mummies were believed to have been tattooed with medical symbols, potentially to treat ailments. Although the meaning of ancient ta Egyptian tattoos may be unclear, it seems evident that they had an array of implications and that women of many different social classes chose to wear them. Baddies. Speaking of things we can't understand, number nine is the pet patrol. Do you guys remember the scene in Disney's Aladdin where he steals a piece of fruit and miraculously evades capture? Well, in real ancient Egypt, our prince wouldn't have stood a chance as police in Egypt used baboons to catch thieves. Incredibly intelligent, these animals were able to be trained, which paired with their speed and ability to jump to places that are difficult for humans to reach, made them the perfect crime fighters. Baboons could also easily remember the face of 
any thief as they are ranked third in the animal world for their memory. So don't go relying on any luck to get away with anything. Outside of their police duties, they were treated incredibly kindly, but trained to participate in picking fruit, making beer, and even dancing. Baboons were so beloved by Egyptians that some mummies were later found to have tattoos of baboons on their bodies. In ancient Egyptian mythology, baboons are best known for their association with Hoth, the god of wisdom. However, they were linked to many other gods as well. Definitely nothing like Babu in Aladdin. But wait, did I say tattoo? Well, being inked up is no modern phenomena. Number eight in our countdown is my favorite pun yet. I put that on everything. Except quite literally. Egyptian doctors used human and animal excrement as a cure-all remedy for diseases and injuries. According to Eber's papyrus recording in 1500 BC, animal feces such as donkey, dog, gazelle, and fly were all celebrated for their healing properties and considered to ward off bad spirits. While we know that Egyptian medicine was incredibly advanced, even having doctors who were specialists, you can't help but question this logic. However, like with most things the Egyptians did, technically they weren't wrong. Research shows that microflora found in some types of animal dung contain antibiotic substances. So sure, you risk some tetanus, but you could also be cured. Lizard blood, dead mice, mud, moldy bread were also all used as topical ointments and dressings, and women were also sometimes dosed with horse saliva as a cure for low libido. And speaking of a woman's libido, man, did the Egyptians have some crazy women's healthcare going on. Number seven, we'll call the fertility games. I have a new family found appreciation for modern medicine after learning a way our ancient Egyptian friends tested fertility was by placing a garlic or onion clove inside of a woman's. This is because ancient Egyptians believed that all orifices of a woman were connected, kind of like subway tunnels. Anyways, if the doctor could smell garlic on your breath the next morning, then the tubes were clear and the woman was fertile. But if the doctor couldn't smell garlic, then the tubes were blocked and it was assumed that the woman couldn't give birth. Once you are pregnant though, you can find out the sex of your baby in another bizarre tradition, popping a squat over some barley. Why? Because if it barely grew, then the baby was a boy. If the barley grew like crazy, then the baby was a girl. This test was believed to be highly accurate, and they weren't wrong in that. Turns out the test was actually accurate in 70% of all cases, and in 1963 lab testing, the urine of a pregnant woman did cause the seeds to sprout. Since she was in fact pregnant with a girl, it's likely the seeds start to grow faster due to elevated levels of estrogen, which stimulates growth. I can think of some true Really hilarious ways to integrate this into a gender reveal party. But kids aren't for everyone, and that's okay. Ancient Egyptians were notoriously not fans of them, so let's talk number six, safe sex. There are actually lots of stories of Egyptian contraceptive methods, but don't get too fascinated because these aren't anything you want to try and recreate. Egyptian women would collect the dung of crocodiles or elephants to mix with sacred herbs and honey. They would then apply this paste mixture to their vulva and up inside the vagina as a protective seal on their genitals. Okay, men, don't think you're getting much better though as your contraceptive was to rub onion juice all over your junk. If neither of these worked, which shocker if they didn't, the Egyptians had an herb called silphium, which was used to help devoid a woman of an unwanted pregnancy. They even knew what has been confirmed today that a chia gum from an achia tree worked as a spermicide and would reduce the likelihood of pregnancy after the fact. While it's impressive they figured out what they did, this whole section just has yeast infection written all over it, so let's just keep going for everybody's sake. Number five, let's reuse, reduce, and recycle our rotten food. More questionable cure-alls. As I mentioned in point number eight, moldy bread was used by doctors for medical reasons such as medicine or gauzing techniques. This is because Egyptians, from what we can gather, seem to have figured out the antibiotic properties and believed the exposure of mold to a wound would better aid in the immune system for next time, if not at least help quicker healing process this time. But Egyptians also reused other rotten foods. For example, sour milk was also used medicinally. Believed bathing in it would help with skin disease or dryness. I mean, all that sand is bound to have a little bit of a chafy effect. Honey, which also happens to be a natural bacteria killer, may not have been rotten, but it was put on open wounds similar to how we use polysporin today. And while rotten donkey liver may not have been medicine, the Egyptians were quick to slather it on their head and get a nice even even die job. Number four in our countdown is a different kind of rotten, the casual neck. The Egyptians were known for their fascination with life, death, and sex. In their beliefs, the god Ra actually created the universe and the first two gods through master. Osiris, another god who eventually came along, became father to Horus posthumously after Isis had 
sex with his dead body. Ra also had sex with Osiris posthumously, but it seems his use of onion juice worked pretty well and he didn't father any children with the dead body. Now, just because it's in their godly pantheon doesn't mean just anyone was necrophilic in ancient Egypt, but those who were may have had that lust arguably feeling a little more justified in their pursuit of rotten ladies. So there was an issue with necrophilia towards the deceased bodies of Egyptian women, to the extent that their loved ones began a habit of letting their corpses sit out for two, three days before passing them to the embalmers so as to dissuade sex. The logic was is that the embalmers wouldn't want to have sex with the body that was already beginning to rot. I mean they shouldn't want to have sex with the body in the first place, but I guess beggars can't be choosers. Regardless, neck and bombers were apparently common enough for the Grecian writer Herodotus, who famously documented a lot of cultures practices to make special note of. Let's take a break from the funky stuff to talk about a different kind of pussy. Number three, the obsession with cats. Guys, I am super biased to this one. Don't know if you can notice the fine sheen of cat hair I rep, but I'm with the ancient Egyptians on the cat praise. Ancient Egyptians were obsessed with cats and even worshipped them. Believed to be gatekeepers of the underworld, these little beasts were spiritual and metaphorical symbols for Egyptians, and they were even believed to be gods themselves. The act of harming, eating, or killing a cat warranted a death penalty as a result. And while adoring your family pet isn't bizarre, the effects of worshipping something are. When the family cat died, every member in the household would shave off their eyebrows to mourn its death. And if a building was burning, people would save the cats before they even put out the fire. Being the first society to domesticate cats, Egyptians used cats for extermination aside from the companionship, which worked so well that their agricultural society dominated that of the Mediterranean for hundreds of years. Of course, there were cons to this obsession. For example, when the Persian invaders showed up using cats as shields, the Egyptian army retreated in fear of killing a cat, allowing the invaders to their soldiers and the pharaoh and take over rule of Egypt. Oops. Unlike other animals, cats were often mummified and buried in tombs dedicated to the goddess Bastet. Recovered cat figurines made of wood, stone, and bronze can be found in museums and collections all across the world. Number two is a modern day medical emergency, but to ancient Egyptians, it was just his time of the month. While it's astounding that medical accomplishments that Egyptians had made, specialized doctors, antibiotics, even surgery, you can see from their contraceptives in point six, Egyptians didn't always nail it. In fact, the disease Shitso Matsasia, we'll just call it by its second name, Bilharzia, was so common that they didn't even realize it was a disease, and it infected nearly everyone. How did it slip under the radar though? The side effects of the disease make people feel sick, and it caused blood in their urine and fecal matter. Seeing as menstruation also came with bloody urine and feeling sick, Egyptians simply thought they were menstruating, and came to accept that men had to do the same as women. Blood and urine became a normal part of growing up for boys, and Egyptian society was already very big on gender nonconformity, even having records of sex changes, so this really was an outlandish thinking to them. In reality, Bilharzia was actually parasitic worms having a field day in their junk. Irregardless, a man peeing blood was even treated as a sign of his fertility. No better sign a man was ready to father a family than being infected with parasites. Man, what a trip this countdown has been. You may be wondering what can take the cake. It's the ceremonial circle in at number one. So as prior mentioned, ancient Egyptians believed Ra to have created much of life and existence through, well, his masturbatory sessions. This was also believed about the Nile River, Egypt's famous river that flows 6,600 kilometers before it empties into the Mediterranean Sea. These ancient Egyptians believed that the flow of the river represented the frequency of Ra's ejection. Seeing as the Nile was the source of Egyptian agriculture, it was incredibly important that that flow remains. Well, it's 4000 BC, and everyday people don't exactly see their gods wandering around. So, with their pharaoh being the personification of God, the duty fell onto him. So, once a year in the last month of summer, during the festival Min that celebrated the pharaoh's rule, the pharaoh would approach the Nile, remove his robe, and master over the Nile River in a sacred public ceremony. He had a large retinue of men that would also match into the river at the same time as him. Once the pharaoh and his men had, well, finished, any man was welcome to unload in the river too. It was believed that these cultural and religious practices would ensure that the Nile would continue to flow for the next year to come, pun intended. Yeah.